Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kendra Collins. I am not Sarah Fern Fitzsimmons this morning, but thank you for joining us for another edition of Chestnut Chat. Um, just a few housekeeping things this morning. Uh, this meeting is being recorded um, primarily so we can put it on our website for anyone that is not able to join us today. Um, it's a webinar format, so those of you in the audience, um, we can't see you, we can't hear you, you can go about your business, you can eat your lunch, whatever you need to do. Um, if you do have a question, please use the Q&A functionality so we can keep track of those. Um, if you have a comment or just something to add to the conversation, um, like Yvonne's comment about daffodils, <laughs> please use the chat for those and we'll kind of keep an eye in both places. Um, and I think... I think that's about it. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Schauberg this morning. Paul was actually my advisor in grad school, so I've known him longer than I've known Chestnuts intimately, <laughs> which is a pretty long time. I started working with Paul in 2005. Um, Paul's a research plant physiologist with the U.S. Forest Service and studies primarily abiotic uh, plant stresses, a lot of cold tolerance work with um, red spruce and sugar maple and, of course, American chestnut. Um, I know he's got a hand in a few other projects as well. Um, he was also Tom Sayeli's um, grad school advisor. Tom's going to be on helping me with the Q&A today. Um, I'm usually hanging out in the background doing that, that role <laughs> for these chestnut chats. So it's kind of a different experience to be in the, the front side of things this morning. Um, but I think that's all I have to say to get things going. Lisa, um, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Kendra. And just a note, Kendra's working from home because of ice and snow because she lives near the Arctic Circle. Um, <laughs> so if her her connectivity goes wonky, I'll take over facilitating, although Paul's going to really take up most of the time with his great information. So just warning that we may lose Kendra, which would be sad, but she might come back. So <laughs> Thanks, Kendra and Tom for hanging out today. Um, welcome everyone, um, happy February. I think this is Chestnut Chat 33. I mean, it's just amazing. When we started this in April, 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, when we didn't know what the world was gonna be like, we kind of did it on a lark and, and it's just grown and grown. The community of Chestnut Chatters has been really fun. Um, I see Russell did make it. Hi, Russell, I hope you like your profile in the magazine, you're famous now. <laughs> um, so anyway, everyone, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over quickly to um, Paul. Tom, did you wanna say anything or you good? Okay, just a quick reminder, again, please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, we will monitor them after Paul's talk. Uh, we won't interrupt Paul during it unless it's just a burning question. Um, and then just general comments and friendly banter in the chat. So with that, Paul, thank you so much. I think we met 2016, something like that, when I first darkened the door of Kendra's office, which, <laughs> by the way, I was the only CEO to visit Kendra's office. And I think I've visited how many times since? Um, quite a few. That's quite a few. But my kid used I mean, to in Burlington and moved to Philly. So I don't have the kid excuse, but I still love her. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> So I'm sure you will <laughs> take it away, Paul, and we'll turn off our videos, Tom, Kendra, and me, so Paul can have center stage. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. So I assume people can see the presentation. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Good. Yeah. We're not full oh. screen. What's that? It's full screen. It's okay, full good. Screen. Yeah. Full screen. Good. 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 Okay. So uh, good morning, everybody. Well, uh, maybe just barely morning for you. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about some preliminary analysis of the influence of cold and climate on American chestnut group, uh, growth. This is work uh, that's been done uh, in collaboration between myself, Paul Murakami, U.S. Forest Service, Kendra Collins, TACF, and Chris Hansen and Gary Hawley at the University of Vermont. Um, and I'll just put a shout out right from, from the start that the beautiful pictures you'll be seeing through here are all from Paul Murakami. Uh, yeah, great job, Paul. <laughs> um, obviously, when you're thinking about American chestnut, the primary factor limiting the health and productivity of the species is chestnut blight. Uh, obviously, anyone who's involved with TACS knows this. 
and knows that the the dominant uh, you know research and uh, you know endeavor is to survive chest blight, um, and that's why TACF has the three burr approach, which involves breeding, biotechnology, and biocontrol. Uh, so this is job number one. However, um, you know, once you do um, start to have some uh, tolerant um, of chestnut blight varieties of chestnut, you need to have a um, planting material that can survive across the range. So on the left-hand part of the screen, you can see the, uh, the what's presumed to be the, the native range of American chestnut. And you can see it's, it's pretty big. It goes you know, from, from the uh, down in the south all the way up to Maine and Vermont. Um, and there are a lot of the different environmental gradients uh, that uh, chestnut once had to endure and thrive in and be competitive in. So one of those, you know, those are gradients in temperature, gradients in moisture. And, um, you know, from someone who's coming from up here in Vermont, you have to think about one of those gradients is winter low temperatures. So on the right hand side of the screen, those are USDA plant hardiness zone maps. Um, with the blue and the purple colors being pretty cold uh, and the warmer colors being pretty warm. Um, and across chestnuts uh, uh, range, those, uh, those uh, spread from zone 8A, uh, which had a uh, average annual uh, extreme minimum temperature over 30 years of being about minus 12 Celsius. That's a plus 10.4 Fahrenheit. Uh, that's the warmest. And then the coldest being uh, zone 5A, minus 29 degrees Celsius as a 30 year average minimum temperature, that's minus 20.2 Fahrenheit. So that's about a 30 degree Fahrenheit spread. And, and that's a big spread for a species to be uh, adapted to. Um, and based on that spread, um, be, again, being based up here in Burlington, Vermont, we suspected that this Northern range of the species may have been limited by sensitivity to low temperatures. Um, you know, so we suspected that, um, but indeed, many years ago, uh, we actually verified that. Um, and so uh, Kendra Collins, pictured here, uh, whose name then was Kendra Gurney, uh, for her master's work actually quantified the limited cold tolerance of American chestnut. Uh, she did this by examining woody shoots, so that's the tissue that overwinters and is most sensitive in hardwood species to uh, freezing damage. Uh, so she looked at uh, the cold tolerance of winter shoots on a seasonal basis, you know, fall, uh, winter and spring, fall for trying to see if there's perhaps inadequate acclimation to the cold. Winter, because that's the time when you have the lowest temperatures. So, so being able to tolerate just absolute low temperatures in winter and then spring in case there was an issue with deacclimation. Um, and this, she did this through a combination of controlled laboratory freezings, which I'll talk about in a second, followed up by assessments of, of field injury. Do you actually see uh, freezing damage uh, in the field? And she did this for chestnut, um, uh, sugar maple, and red oak. Chestnut, because that's the species we thought may be you know, uh, vulnerable. Uh, then sugar maple and red oak, because those are native um, competitors that are presumably acclimated to local environments. Now in the lab, <laughs> this is gonna look like a lot of stuff here, but in the lab that entailed taking those shoots from the field, bringing them in, chopping them up into little five millimeter segments, and then taking those segments and putting them in these trays you see in the upper left-hand corner, putting them in there and then the trays gradually bring, going from uh, a fairly warm temperature, non-damaging temperature, like five degrees uh, Celsius, all the way to a, a kill temperature, minus 90 degrees Celsius. And uh, as each of those temperatures were reached, um, taking trays out and looking for damage. Uh, so damage was assessed as relative electrolyte leakage. So what that means is, uh, the loss of electrolytes from cells. 
So if you look at the bottom right hand corner, you'll see this diagram of a plant cell, the red line being a membrane, the plasma membrane holding in all these electrolytes that are inside the cell. When that membrane is undamaged and functioning right, it holds those, those electrolytes in just well. However, as that membrane becomes cold stressed and then damaged and then killed, uh, it leaks those electrolytes out into the outside environment. Um, and by measuring how much of those electrolytes are leaking out, you can tell how damaged those cells are. The bottom left-hand corner basically shows that this on the, on the y-axis, that's relative electrolyte leakage. On the x-axis, that's the temperature that you're bringing those test uh, cells down to. And it goes from a warm temperature plus five over where I have the cursor, um, and gradually gets lower and lower temperatures down to minus 70 in this diagram. Um, and it shows that you have minimum electrolyte leakage, very low uh, number uh, in the warmer temperatures. But as you get lower and lower, you start to have membrane damage, membrane uh, leakage, and it goes up and up and up um, as the, the temperatures get lower and damage uh, increases until finally you have um, you know, cell uh, uh, full damage and mortality, and then you just flatline it here. What we do to estimate electro, uh, the cold tolerance is we look for the midpoint of this curve right here, um, the TM we call it, temperature of the midpoint. And that's the 50% uh, damage uh, level. That's where you basically have damage of no return. The, the cell is not going to repair itself at that point. And that's a really good indicator of, of um, you know, where the cold tolerance of the, of the cells are. So with that <laughs> as some background, uh, this, is, this is a diagram of the cold tolerance of American chestnut. Season is on the x-axis here. Temperature is here. That's the temperature at that, that midpoint of the curve. That's the cold tolerance at where you know, cell death begins. Um, and we have uh, 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 cold tolerance information for American chestnut and certain back crosses of chestnut, and then uh, maple and oak, those competitors, uh, which should be uh, more cold tolerant. You'll see in the fall here, um, basically all the different species um, are, are indistinguishable. There's no, they're very similar, but this was done in late fall um, and they're pretty cold tolerant. Um, as you get into winter though, you start seeing some differences. So differences are indicated by differences in letters. So same letters, no difference statistically on those cold tolerance levels, different levers are different. You'll see that from fall to winter, the chestnuts increase in cold tolerance a little bit, but not very much. In contrast, the native um, hardwood competitors, they increase more and are in, uh, such that in winter, they are more cold tolerant. If you go to spring then, everything deacclimates, as you would imagine. Um, and then again, they are not statistically different. So what this goes to show is that there is a difference between American chestnut and native uh, hardwoods. American chestnut is less cold tolerant and that window of vulnerability is winter. So that's, those are laboratory uh, indications. I think what's perhaps more informative is that we see that in the field as well. So this is the winter injury of American chestnut shoots. It's evident as a shoot that didn't break bud. You can see the, the buds never broke. Um, it's, uh, it's also indicative that as these shoots die, they desiccate. Um, they turn a darker color, the bark cracks. And with a dead, um, uh, apical, uh, you know, meristem, uh, the, these buds never break. It means that the latter, the lower buds, lateral buds, they are no longer suppressed by oxen production from the uh, uh, apex. And so those buds break and you start uh, losing the dominance of the, of the main shoot and you start getting this kind of bushy appearance over here as, as the lateral buds come out and make new branches and you start having a, yeah, start having things don't look like quite like a, a chestnut tree. 
So that's the, that's the circumstance that we found for uh, you know, a planting in, in one place uh, with pretty much a, a very limited set of, of genes representing the species, American chestnut. Um, but, you know, American chestnut, if you look at the bottom uh, left here, American chestnut had a big range. Um, and it's very reasonable to suspect that uh, coal tolerance and other traits vary across that range because the, those uh, plants in those areas had to be adapted to very different environments. So one way of looking at the variation across a, a broad population across the range is to collect seed from across that, that range um, and to plant that seed in a common garden. So that the seed represents a variety of, of um, presumably genetically adapted sites to a, a broad uh, uh, gradient in, in the geography, but they're planted in, a, in the same uh, common garden environment, which should be a pretty uniform environment. Therefore, any differences that you see here um, would be due to uh, genetics um, and less, less so the environment. So I, I want to put a shout out that uh, Tom Saeli, um, what I'm going to presenting this, this common garden, which as far as we know is the first and only American chestnut provenance test. Uh, this was uh, created um, by Tom Saeli, Saeli for his master's work with our group. Uh, and indeed, this was a ton of work. Um, I'm only gonna be talking about uh, the, the trees planted in the, in the open in uh, the common garden. This was actually also a silvicultural study that involved uh, open planting, planting these same seed sources in a partial cut. So a, a, second, a first stage and a three stage shelter wood, um, and then a closed canopy. Um, so, so the, there's actually a lot more to say about this. I'm not, I'm not gonna touch on that today. So these are, the, these are the 13 seed sources of American chestnut that are planted in this common garden. Uh, they range from the, uh, the south uh, in North Carolina to the north in Maine. Um, and they were chosen because we presume that they would be, because they have this spread in latitude, um, uh, differences in potential cold tolerance and other traits. Um, and you see there, this is the latitudinal spread here, but um, although uh, midwinter temperatures are influenced by, by latitude, they're also influenced by elevation. So the higher you go up in elevation, the colder it typically is. And so rather than just rely on latitude, um, Tom created a, a, a kind of a combination of latitude and elevational uh, information to look at the uh, the typical winter low temperatures for each of these locations, and we then group those those um, winter low temperature uh, uh, information into creating categories. So they're temperature zone categories, and they range from uh, a warm temperature zone, typically because it's both uh, low in latitude and low in elevation, all the way to um, you know, a cold temperature uh, zone, which is typically high in latitude and sometimes higher in elevation with a bunch of things in the middle. So there's warm temperature zone, moderate temperature zone, and cold temperature zone. And because, um, you know, because of this, uh, creating this study was a ton of work, as I mentioned, we have been monitoring it uh, since its inception back in 2009 on the Green Mountain National Forest to uh, evaluate a number of traits. Um, winter injury um, being very prominent in that, that's, that was key in our minds, but many other traits too, because those could vary with um, you know, uh, temperature zone and seed source, et cetera. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on a subset of those traits we've been monitoring over the years. So um, one of those things that can change because of the, um, you know, the, the geography of, of the original seed source is phenology. Um, so we've been monitoring phenology for a number of years using this phenological stage um, uh, index. Um, 
this is kind of shows that what we do is we, we have ranked uh, the uh, uh, emergence of, of the uh, buds um, and leaves ranking from uh, over here, uh, rank zero, which is basically a fully dormant bud. Gradually, you can see the, the gradual emergence of uh, the, uh, the primordial leaf tissue from that, the expansion of leaves all the way to a fully expanded leaf. And we do this for each, <laughs> each plant, um, looking at the stage uh, on the plant on each time we go out there that's most advanced. So if we go out there and uh, you know, uh, we see that there are even one bud on the plant that's rank three, that's our starting number. And you can see up here is, is the composite number, the starting number being three. That's the most advanced uh, stage of, of bud uh, expansion. The second number is the percentage of, of buds that are at that most advanced level. So for example, if 50% of the buds are at rank three, then we give it a three, most advanced stage, 0.5, five standing for 50% buds at that stage. So using this ranking, I'll show you data later, but we, we were able to then determine when we de deem that tree to be in bud break. And operationally, we defined that as when the tree was at the stage 3.5. So we looked at phenology. Uh, obviously, we looked at winter injury because we knew that that from Kendra's work, that was an issue. Uh, and we expected that because of past work. But we also uh, experienced things that we didn't expect so much. One of them was spring frost. Um, you can see these pictures showing the, uh, you know, after the, the buds broke and leaves started to emerge in Vermont, it gets cold, we have frosts. Um, and uh, it was not uncommon for uh, the leaves uh, either at very emergent uh, time periods or after they were developed a bunch, uh, uh, some to be damaged um, by frost. And that damage can sometimes be really extensive as you can see in this picture here, but also as I'll be showing data for later on. So this was unexpected. Uh, just another indication that between winter injury and spring frost injury that at least in Vermont, um, that chestnut seems to be very uh, cold sensitive. But we also wanted to look at tree growth because we were interested in how um, phenology how cold injury and just climate in general may influence tree growth. Um, and although we do th things like measure tree heights and tree diameters with a, a diameter tape, really the most precise way of looking at tree growth is through tree running analysis. So that involves taking an increment borer, which is kind of like a big corkscrew, uh, boring it into the tree and taking out these kind of pencil thin uh, slithers of wood that you then mount and sand, and then can look at under a microscope and measure with a stage micrometer um, to very precisely look at how much wood is produced in any one annual ring. So you can see them in the center of the screen. The annual rings are actually quite distinct um, with the uh, darker uh, parts of an annual ring being the late wood, the, very, uh, the lighter part being the early wood vessels, so those are the, the large uh, vessels that carry the, most of the, of the water in, in the, the xylem ring. And we'll be talking more about those later. Um, but you can easily age the tree. You can easily measure its, its growth. And so we looked at growth levels. You know, so how much are they growing? What are the trends over time? Are they you know, growing more over time or not? But then importantly, doing correlations of those growth levels with other measurement parameters like uh, winter shoot injury, leaf um, frost injury, or the phenology measurements, when is bud break? And, but also using correlating that growth with climate parameters. So getting temperature and moisture um, uh, levels for the site and seeing how is growth related to those. That's kind of important because we want to know how sensitive the species is, uh, again, across, you know, uh, there's a lot of different genetic 
types here, but in general, how is a species related to um, you know, the kind of temperature and precipitation levels that, that it's experiencing? So let's dive into the data. So um, this, uh, this and other figures will show year at the bottom, and then the, whatever measurement parameter there is on the uh, y-axis, here it's shoot winter injury as a percent of the current year shoots. Um, and then it has the, um, the outcomes in that parameter uh, divided among the warm temperature zone sources, the moderate temperature zone sources in orange, and the cold temperature zone sources in blue. Right off the bat, you'll see there's a lot of variation amongst the years, everything from very low winter injury um, in 2016 here to pretty high winter injury in 2015. Um, it's important to note that we always, whether it's low or high, we always saw some winter injury. This is a, a, a kind of a constant phenomenon up on uh, in cold Vermont where these trees are planted. You'll see that uh, these letters indicate when there are statistically different uh, differences in winter injury among the temperature zone sources. Uh, so there are some years when, it, it, although it looks like a trend, you can't statistically discern differences. That's typically when it's very low injury. But there's other times when you can. And whenever you can see a difference in injury, you'll see a difference in these letters um, it's always that the warm temperature zone sources have more winter injury than the moderate and the cold. And this makes sense because uh, you, know, you would expect the warm temperature zone sources to not be you know, forced to be adaptive to low temperatures that you'd see, for example, in Vermont. So differences in genetics and when, and when they occur um, with the warm temperature zones being more sensitive to the cold. So this is bud break. So there's a lot here. Uh, I'm gonna concentrate first on the panel on the left and then we'll go to the right. So remember bud break was defined as if the tree hits 3.5, that's 50% of the buds reaching stage three, we called that bud break. Again, uh, year is the uh, X axis and in, in the left panel, Julian days. So it's the number of the day of the year basically starting in January 1 as day one and moving forward uh, in a continuous measurement up to 365, we see that uh, um, across these years, 20, uh, 2012 up through 2016, again, there's a fair amount of variation. Still, it's warm temperature zones, red, orange, moderate, blue, cold. You know, sometimes there's no difference among uh, the uh, temperature zones, such as 2012. But other times there are, um, and it's when there are differences, it's always that the warm temperature zone breaks bud earlier in the year. So a, a lower Julian date number. And you'll see that year to year, there's a big variation in when that happens. It can be pretty early uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a warm spring. It can be fairly late in a, a, in a colder spring, um, but uh, can pretty consistently warm temperature zone sources break bud earlier. The, the right-hand panel is again, uh, bud break, that 3.5 number, but not on day of the year, but on accumulated warmth. So growing degree days, you can see at the very bottom here, that's a measure of the accumulation of mean daily temperatures above five degrees Celsius, starting at day one and going on through bud break. So it's an accumulated warmth index. You'll see again, a lot of year-to-year -year variation, um, but, um, you know, you some years there's fairly low cumulative uh, warmth before bud break, sometimes it's much later, but when it does occur, the warm temperature zone uh, sources, actually they're responsive to a lower accumulation of warmth um, before they break bud. Um, so again, genetic differences that are pretty consistent through the planting. So here's the, the thing that we didn't anticipate entirely. Um, you'll notice that in these other figures, there's five years of data here. Um, now we're looking at spring frost damage. Let's look at the left-hand panel. Um, so this is again year, and this is foliar damage as a percent. So the percent of leaves on the tree that were damaged in any one year. 
Um, you'll notice that two of the years aren't even represented here because there was no fol foliar frost damage, 2011 and 2014. But in the years that there was uh, a foliar frost damage, big variation, um, everything from 2012, which is a fairly low damage year, to 2015, where 100% of the leaves on every tree had some kind of damage. So <laughs> quite a spread. Um, it's also interesting to note that although there are differences among the cold tolerance zones, it varies a lot as to what's the most uh, injured or least injured. That's because we found out that what was really important for spring frost injury was what level of, of um, leaf elongation was at when those low temperatures came in. So um, there's certainly, when the, when the buds are very closed and fairly protected, you can have a frost and nothing's a problem. Or if you have the leaves very expanded and starting to harden, again, not a, not a problem. But it's stages of that intermediate development um, relative to the timing and extent of frost that creates this, this big spread in expression. This right-hand panel is, is basically looking at once you have a foliar frost, especially the significant foliar frost in 2013 and 2015, how much of a reflush is, uh, of new uh, leaves occurs. And again, you see um, you know, a big spread. There was no reflush when you had no frost injury or you had low frost injury, such in 20, uh, 2012. But in years with greater frost injury, more reflush, the more injury, the more reflush. Um, and again, um, it varied among sources, um, you know, uh, climate zone sources, but uh, in, in kind of a variable way. Moving to growth. <laughs> so this is basal area increment. So that's in these uh, uh, increment cores, looking at these tree rings and measuring that linear distance uh, under a microscope, but then adjusting that linear distance for the uh, area of wood around the, the bowl of the tree, rather than just being a, you know, a, a measurement of just length, it's a measurement of area, centimeters squared. That's basal area increment. So it's a measure of the kind of the area of wood being put on over time. Now, these trees were planted in 20, uh, in, sorry, um, in 2009. Um, by the time they got big enough to increment core, um, the first year we could read was 2011. And you'll see that as a kind of a broad arc, you'll see that as the trees got older, their growth increased and increased and increased. Um, those differences in growth among the temperature zones, uh, you know, were often significantly different, especially as the trees were maturing. Um, and such that the, the uh, moderate temperature zone sources tended to be growing the most. The cold temperature zone sources tended to be growing the least. However, those differences, the statistical differences among those, uh, diminished as the trees got older. Though you can see that same basic pattern occurring, they were not statistically different. Um, I will, will mention and come back to this that you know as these trees uh, matured and were growing, by the time this 2018 measurement was made, uh, they were growing really well, <laughs> uh, really somewhat remarkably well. And I, and I think that's important because that's despite the fact that these trees were being winter injured, losing shoots, they were having spring frost injury, um, and so they were losing leaves. So there's a lot of, of, of challenges that they were facing, and yet they're growing superbly. And I'll provide some context for that uh, later. So we were, we were interested in all those parameters individually. So what was winter injury like? What was uh, you know, spring frost uh, damage like? What was phenology like? And what was uh, you know, just growth in general? But we also wanted to relate those parameters. Um, and, and we did so through correlations, trying to look at what was related to more or less growth, for example. So one thing we found that was related to more growth was earlier bud break. So if you had earlier bud break, so the leaves were opening up and expanding, 
and therefore the, the uh, leaves were uh, able to photosynthesize earlier, that expansion of the growing season, that earlier bud break and, and leaf function was associated with, with greater growth. And as I mentioned, um, it was the uh, warm temperature zone sources that disproportionately uh, broke bud earlier. So they actually, you know, you, you especially see this relationship with early bud break and increased growth for them. Uh, interesting, foliar frost injury was not related to altered growth. Now, this could be because, you know, it just does, it doesn't make enough of a difference in the, in the carbon relations to the plant. I suspect it's also actually because um, we only had significant um, uh, foliar frost injury in two of the years of the, you know, eight years we were measuring uh, woody growth. So it just wasn't much of a sample size. This may need to be revisited, but at least for our data, foliar frost injury not related to altered growth. However, winter shoot damage, that freezing injury of the uh, current year shoots was related to reduced growth. And again, this was especially the case when you had significant shoot loss, and that was most likely with warm temperature zone sources. So these are all um, kind of extreme injury events uh, over phen phenology events related to growth. But we also related growth to just moisture and temperature at the site. So this is a complicated <laughs> figure. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend a little time to walk uh, everybody through this a bit. So these are correlation co coefficients. This shows the relationship of some parameter, this is moisture metrics with growth. Uh, the bigger the bar, the more uh, of a, of a uh, mathematical correlation there is between the two. Um, looking at this, you'll see that there are abbreviations for months at the bottom. There's lowercase months um, on the left-hand side of the screen. Those are uh, relation, correlations of moisture and growth where the moisture parameters are from the year before that tree ring was grown. I'll explain why that's, uh, why that's meaningful in a second. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen, those, uh, uh, those uppercase letters, uh, abbreviations months, that's the current year moisture related to growth. So that's, that's relationships with um, moisture the year that that ring was formed. Um, so uh, looking in a different direction, you see there's a baseline of zero here. That's no relationship. Um, if you're above that baseline, that signifies a positive relationship between that moisture metric and growth. So more moisture, more growth. If you're uh, below that uh, baseline of zero, that signifies a negative relationship. Um, so more moisture, less growth. Uh, further complicating things here uh, is the fact that uh, you'll see that a lot of these uh, bars have no asterisk on top of them, but seven of them do. So we really need to focus on those seven that do because those asterisks indicate um, that those relationships are statistically significant. Those are beyond the chance of, you know, a, a spurious relationship, a, an accidental relationship. So that's kind of the big picture. You'll see that on the right-hand side of the screen here, there are actually four different water metrics uh, that are represented by different color bars. Uh, just straight off precipitation in that month is a black uh, bar. Uh, there's a water year metric, which basically starting October 1, that's the beginning of the water year, and then uh, adding on uh, precipitation for each uh, month thereafter, so a cumulative metric of moisture um, moving through the year. Then there's two SPEI metrics, uh, 0, 01 and 0, 03. That's basically taking the precipitation and adjusting it for evaporative de de demand. So how, not only how moist it is, but how hot it is, and therefore how uh, limited water may be. So that said, um, whether, however you're looking at, at moisture, and we looked at it multiple ways, the bottom line is that um, there are many positive associations between growth and moisture. And basically they're all that, Higher moisture the year uh, the year before growth 
and the year of ring formation uh, are strongly associated with greater growth. So let me talk about that year before relationship. Um, so all trees, uh, when they're growing their wood, they're using a combination of uh, carbohydrate, sugars, uh, and starch that are both stored in the tree from the year, years before, and also the new uh, carbohydrates being put in by the, uh, the leaves that are produced that year. That's true for all trees. It's a combination of carbon sources. But especially for a ring porous tree like uh, American chestnut, which is actually growing those new early wood vessels even before the leaves uh, uh, are, are present, before the buds break. So they're producing those big early wood vessels. Uh, it's especially important to use that older stored um, carbon, which is reliant on the, the older climate of the time. So that's the, the year before relationship. The year of, uh, of um, relationships with moisture, just saying that you also are gaining carbon as the leaves are, are expanded and they're, and they're photosynthesizing. So that carbon, uh, that those sugars are also important for a ring formation. So um, water is good. <laughs> um, and this is kind of interesting uh, for this study in that um, we did this study in a time, at least in Vermont, when moisture is actually uh, more available than historic norms. It's wetter in Vermont um, than it was 30 years ago. Um, and so you're seeing this improvement in growth with more moisture, even though we're in what they call pluvial, a time period of, of, of wetter than average um, you know, conditions. Uh, it's also interesting, I think, because American chestnut is considered to be a somewhat drought resistant species. So it can tolerate um, a certain amount of, of water limitations. Uh, but despite that tolerance, uh, growth is definitely benefited uh, by having more moisture. So that's moisture. Let's look at temperature. Okay, so this, is, this, this uh, figure follows the exact same format as the last one. Uh, those lowercase uh, letters are uh, data of correlation between temperature and growth for the year before ring formation. The upper case letters are the relationships for the year of ring formation. A, uh, a bar uh, above the zero line is a positive correlation. A bar below the zero line is a negative correlation. And what we see is, although it looks like there's a lot of stuff going on here, there's only one, uh, one year uh, and one month where uh, temperature is related to growth. And interestingly, it's a negative correlation. So there, as opposed to moisture, where there are many uh, significant correlations, there are few associations between growth and temperature. And the only one that shows up is a negative association with the previous December temperatures. So what does this mean? So it can mean one of two things, either that higher temperatures in December, the year before means lower growth, or it could mean that lower temperatures the year before uh, ring formation means higher growth. So uh, neither of these are in entirely intuitive. However, uh, I think it's the second relationship. Lower temperatures in December may relate to higher growth that may be at play here. And I'll explain why. So um, we've actually looked at, and other labs have looked at um, relationships of temperature and precipitation with growth of many uh, tree species. We've looked at, I think, eight at this point, and for all of the hardwood species, except one, red maple, which is curiously not very sensitive to the environment relative to other species, um, for, for all of them, we see that uh, December precipitation, especially December snow, is related to uh, growth. The more snow, the more growth. And Controlled studies with sugar maple have shown that this is because the snow actually acts as an insulator across the surface of, of the soil and buffers the soil below from freezing temperatures. If you have an, a December or January snowfall and it builds up a snowpack, even if you get low temperatures uh, from the air, 
the soil is, is buffered from that, it doesn't freeze, um, and the roots are protected from freezing damage. In contrast, if you have um, you know, warmer temperatures in December, low snowpack, uh, ironically, eventually it does eventually get cold, and that cold uh, air penetrates the soil, it freezes the soil, sometimes rather substantially, and it damages roots and trees with damaged roots don't grow so well. <laughs> so uh, I don't know that's what's going on here. Um, we have not physiologically looked into this or done a controlled test, but for other species, that's what's been shown to be the case. And so I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case here as well. So before I mentioned that, um, uh, that American chestnut growth was really superb. Um, and so the overall productivity, especially in that year, that last year, 2018 year, was very high. And I'll show you how high that was. So the basal area increment was 34 uh, centimeters squared. That's American chestnut, the top line here. Here are other tree species that we've um, uh, measured growth in, in Vermont. Um, and you'll see that when you're talking about sugar maple, red maple, yellow birch, American beech, red oak, and eastern hemlock. American chestnut is beating them out. The only species that we've measured in our lab that it doesn't beat out is Eastern white pine, which is a notable, um, you know, fast growing tree. Uh, but I'll also comment that uh, I wouldn't, I don't think this is the, the maximum that, that these trees could grow. Indeed, you remember from that, that uh, figure of basal area increment over time, that there's kind of like this J shaped curve that we're, we uh, saw growth going on. We stopped measuring in 2018. We don't know where this plateau is for these trees. Um, and, and I don't think there's any reason to think that, it, that that's the maximum. So the maximum could well be something more akin to Eastern white pine. We, we shall see. So um, I want to start kind of capsulating this information to try to make some sense of, uh, of what we found. So some conclusions. So regardless of genetic source, we found that American chestnut is value, uh, vulnerable to both uh, winter shoot freezing injury and spring leaf frost damage. This is not surprising because it's a, we're growing chestnut at the northern limit of its uh, you know, range. And so when you have a species um, at that limit, it's often presumed that uh, low temperatures are one of the constraining factors. We're certainly seeing that for these uh, trees. However, the level of vulnerability did vary among the genetic sources, such that the warm temperature zones were great, uh, generally greatest at risk for damage. Again, that makes sense. Um, those uh, uh, you know, warm uh, temperature zone sources uh, evolved in a much warmer climate, and they didn't necessarily have to put a lot of resources into getting very cold on it. I'll circle back on that thought later. Um, some other conclusions. Genetic sources sometimes differed in, in growth, and we saw that especially during the, the kind of the juvenile period of, of increasing growth, but differences were actually pretty modest compared to the overall growth potential, which again was superb. <laughs> um, and growth was generally higher with a lengthened growing season, uh, earlier bud breaking, earlier leaf out, so longer that you had leaves on there, the more uh, photosynthetic potential, the, uh, the more growth potential. Um, but growth was depressed following uh, elevated shoot winter injury. Again, makes total sense. You're losing a lot of uh, shoots. You're losing those buds and new leaves. You're losing the stored carbohydrates in those shoots. Uh, you would imagine that could be negative to growth. We also saw climate influences and genetic influence at a, at a variety of levels. The climate influences obviously highlight the vulnerability of the species to cold damage, um, both shoot and foliar cold damage, um, but also uh, highlight the influence of, of adequate moisture availability in American chestnut growth. Uh, you know, even in a, a drought tolerant species, uh, growing in a place that's pretty wet. Uh, at least during, during our study, more water was a, a good thing. And there were genetic influences, basically that the warm temperature zone trees were more cold sensitive, they broke bud earlier, and they tended to have pretty high growth. Uh, 
whereas the cold zone trees grew less but had a uh, uh, lower winter injury. Interestingly, uh, we found that the moderate temperature zone sources kind of seemed to, to uh, meet an interesting uh, sweet spot in the middle. They tended to have low foliar frost injury and low sh uh, shoot winter injury, but they also uh, showed exemplary growth. Uh, I think this is interesting because it's pretty consistent what others have found for provenance tests for a lot of species overall. So summaries of, of provenance test results for many species have actually shown that the seed sources that grow the best are often populations from 200 uh, plus miles south of the planting location um, and that they grow well in those locations without significant increases in tree and freezing injury. Now, this makes sense because you can imagine at very warm temperature zones or uh, areas that where that experience very limited cold stress, uh, a plant does not necessarily have to put a lot of resources into becoming cold tolerant. Uh, whereas in very cold places, uh, plants do have to put a lot of resources into becoming cold tolerant. And uh, it's actually considered um, that there's, there is a presumed ecological trade-off, physiological trade-off between becoming very, um, between putting resources to growth versus protection. If you're taking a lot of carbon and other resources to uh, grow, let's say, like for example, in the South, where, where protection of the cold is not important, that could make you very competitive. You don't have to be very cold tolerant, but you want to uh, outgrow your, uh, your neighbors and your competitors. In contrast, in the North, where you, you pretty much know you're going to be getting a lot of cold temperatures, you want to be protected from the, that cold. You don't want to die down to ground level because of, of freezing injury. Um, and so you divert a lot of the sugars and other resources into becoming very cold tolerant, um, but therefore you don't have those resources to grow. So in the middle though, um, you know, you have, you have to become somewhat cold tolerant, but you also want to outcompete your neighbors in growth. So you probably take a, a middle ground approach. Um, and so that's, that's the interpretation for why this species of uh, uh, seed sources just a little bit south of where the planting site is probably split that difference. Maybe not being conservative enough for when really low temperatures uh, occur, but on a more year to year common uh, weather level, they do just fine. So in closing, I wanna provide some perspective. So our study, as the title indicated, preliminary look at, at what's going on as far as cold and climate relations for American chestnut. I think we found many interesting associations regarding climate sensitivity, um, but this is a very limited window. This was not a forever study. This, this, these plants have only been there since 2009. So our data has a, a definitely a limited time scale, eight years for the tree core data, five years for some of the uh, winter injury and phenology, uh, et cetera, data. Um, so, that limited um, time frame, and also just looking at it in one location, does not provide a, a you know a very broad look at potential climate sensitivity. And so I'm going to put in a plug for doing something that perhaps would give you a better view of that. So I think it'd be more informative to take that tree ring approach. So taking tree rings and looking at climate analysis correlations but doing it for older trees, trees with more climate exposure, you know, rather than, um, you know, eight years of growth, you know, 80 years of growth. Um, and so there's much more likely to see, uh, you know, uh, extremes or different changing uh, exposures to temperature and then perhaps especially precipitation. So more years, uh, older trees, more years of growth, but do that also over a broader geographic scale. So if you if you got those tree rings, but it isn't just one spot in Vermont, for example, but you're getting those tree rings from trees across the range of the species, again, you're going to get a better look at um, the the range in temperature, precipitation, and other exposures over a longer time period. 
And with that, you'll get a much more nuanced and broader look at the climate sensitivity of American chestnut. So something, something to, to strive for, perhaps. So with that, I'd like to close and open it up to questions. Um, I guess this is your cue, uh, uh, Tom, perhaps, or oh, Kendra, here, there, here you are. Yep, thank you, to, uh, Paul. I appreciate that, that talk. It was kind of fun. Tom and I were chatting offline. And, um, it was fun to hear our grad work rehashed, <laughs> <laughs> brought back some memories. Um, so we have uh, plenty of questions to fill the rest of our time together here. Um, a lot about climate change, a lot about sort of the ins and outs of your actual um, research methods, um, and a whole bunch of other things. So I'm going to start with a few of the research kind of nitty gritty questions. Hey, Frank Kendra, wants to know. Kendra, yes. Sorry, can um, Paul? Can you unshare your screen so? People Absolutely. can see your smiling face and Kendra's smiling face. Thanks. <laughs> Lucky everyone. <laughs> um, all right. So Frank wants to know, Paul, how long does the temperature have to be held to get cold damage? I think that came in when you were talking about relative electrolyte leakage. Yeah. So um, we, in the lab, we use methods that um, try to uh, eliminate variability. We don't want the temperatures to be jumping around a lot. We don't want temperatures to be getting cold very fast um, because that, that could create a rapid freezing thing. We want a very controlled freezing. So we, uh, we hold it at a temperature for uh, a half hour or 45 minutes at, at the what we call the test temperature. And then we very gradually lower the temperature thereafter. And that takes another half hour or 45 minutes. And then we can hold it at that new test temperature for a while. And at the end of that hold period, after it's been exposed to that low temperature for a while, then we take out uh, one of those trays of samples. So that's, that's as low as those samples have gotten and they don't see any lower temperatures. We just do that over and over and over again for 15 or 17 um, uh, test temperatures to get that look at uh, absolute low temperature exposure without having rapid freezing or, or, or odd freeze thaw cycles. Yes, and I have, I have some fond memories of all those <laughs> test temperature takeouts. Brings me back. Um, As do I. <laughs> Julia has a, a couple of questions. Actually, maybe just one. I think I'm confusing her with someone else. She wonders, can electrolyte leakage be offset through soil treatments, i.e. calcium, chlorine, um, potassium, I think probably aluminum would, would jump in there, uh, those supplements for vulnerable trees. My understanding is that many Northeastern trees, not just chestnut, are projected to be vulnerable to root damage and subsequent leakage because of diminished snowpack and lack of insulation for frost um, thaw cycles. And I know that's something you have some experience with. Yeah, so first of all, the nutritional part, uh, yes, nutrition makes a difference. Um, we've actually seen that with a variety of our acid rain studies because acid rain leaches calcium uh, from the soil and increases aluminum exposure. Calcium is needed to actually stabilize the membranes of cells on the outside of that membrane, like I showed on the diagram. There are calcium bridges. Calcium is a divalent cation. It kind of uh, helps solidify the membrane. Um, uh, whereas uh, aluminum uh, over solidifies the membrane, is, is, it binds on there and doesn't get off. So nutrition definitely makes a difference. Um, usually within the normal range of, 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 of soil nutrition, so aside from uh, you know, a very aberrant site or aside from acid deposition, the normal levels of calcium lumen are, are not modulating cold tolerance a ton. Um, but that is an issue. Um, as far as the soil freezing goes, yes, uh, we, um, although this has been studied a lot for certain species, uh, um, sugar maple in the east and yellow cedar in southeastern Alaska, that uh, a lack of snow cover means increased soil freezing, means increased root damage and the decline of trees. Uh, it can even mean the death of trees. Um, there, there are graphic pictures of this online of, uh, of yellow cedar. Um, so this, this can be a big issue. Um, the, uh, yeah, 
So, so yes, that's an important thing. This is the first indication that there may be something about this with uh, American chestnut. Again, we've not verified this. It's just an interesting finding that, that warrants some uh, you know, follow-up. All right, well, a couple more related to um, the actual research um, project that you, or projects that you, you talked about. Um, Jack uh, Morris wants to know, hi, Jack. Uh, why is cold tolerance less in spring versus winter and fall? So um, basically, um, plants face a trade-off in uh, being physically, uh, physiologically active versus being protected. During the winter, uh, the composition of membranes actually changes, um, and uh, there are less saturated fats in the lipids to make them a little more mobile. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, sugar content of cells changes. Uh, plants put a lot of uh, sugar into the cell as sucrose and raffinose and other forms, and that helps create kind of an antifreeze of, of the plants. But basically these physiolog physiological changes that help protect the plant also make it less physiological uh, and, and active. So uh, in the spring, if you want cells that are you know, functional, that can photosynthesize, that can you know, do a variety of things, you reverse those changes in physiology and uh, you draw down the amount of sugars in the, in the cytoplasm, you change your membrane structure, you, uh, decompose some of the uh, proteins that made it made it uh, uh, you know cold tolerant, um, but in that process you make it much more physiologically uh, active, and uh, you know so it can do the good work of you know growing, photosynthesizing, and functioning. Great, um, thanks, Paul. Jim wants to know where were the chestnut, oak, and maple trees from geographically that were compared for cold tolerance. And I feel like I can actually answer that one because yeah. <laughs> that was my project. Yes, it was. Um, so the chestnuts, yeah, the chestnuts were primarily from an orchard in Shelburne, Vermont um, uh, at Shelburne Farms. And um, the two parent sources of the backcross trees were actually from Southern Vermont, but they'd all been planted in this orchard um, for their whole lives. And then the oak and sugar maple were collected from a nearby forested area that we were able to access um, just, I don't know, maybe a quarter mile away, maybe half, I don't know. How close is that, Paul? About half mile? Yeah, it, was pretty, it was pretty close. <laughs> pretty close. Yeah, I mean, like they're not, yeah. Driving was actually far, farther than walking probably. <laughs> um, and then we did have some chestnut also from a similar background that was collected on the Green Mountain National Forest in Sunderland, Vermont, which is in the southern part of the state. Um, just a few examples of those. So um, there was one, one question I wanted to get back to. So um, we have a question from Brunswick, Maine. I realize that Maine is the northern limit of the natural range of the American chestnut. But at a presentation of the national meeting in Portland, Maine, a speaker suggested that the climate in Maine in 2050 would be similar to the climate in Maryland today. And I think that was actually the Maine state climatologist that we had join us at that meeting. Uh, that would seem to bode well for my trees. Do you agree with that projection? So, yeah, I'm not in the, in the business of projecting climate, but yes, I, I, I've, uh, I'm aware of those, those kind of projections and indeed, the concept that um, that the environment on the northern range of, of American chestnut might be improving was part of the impetus for why we've been studying uh, the health and productivity of American chestnut in the north. It, basically, the idea that these northern populations may actually be the northern front of an expansion of, of uh, the range of chestnut uh, moving forward. Um, now, also in those projections are things like, you know, a lot of uncertainty, like, oh, is there going to be, you know, uh, in general warmer winters, but a lot of freeze-thaw cycles, or, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, uh, variability, extreme weather events, things that are either suspected or potential um, limitations, but yes, that... I've, uh, I'm aware of the same projections and one can be cautiously optimistic that that bodes well for chestnut, 
but there's a lot of uncertainty too, but yeah, perhaps range expansion. Um, sort of somewhat related, um, I think this is Clark asks, elevation versus latitude was mentioned. I heard a speaker a few years ago state that a thousand feet in elevation is equivalent to a certain number of miles north of that point in the Billy Southern Hemisphere. I forget what the number was, perhaps 50, perhaps 50 miles, perhaps 200. Do you have such a correlation or rule of thumb? Uh, so there is one. I, I don't remember what it is. I can I can get on my phone and Google it, <laughs> but yes, there, there, <laughs> my, there is a, It's you know I I thought it was about a hundred miles per thousand feet of elevation, but I'm not sure off the top of my head either. I'm sorry, Clark. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paula, you look for that. I'm gonna find yeah. <laughs> your next question. Uh, um, well, actually, I'm just going to take the next couple. We have a couple from Mike. Um, so he says, hi, Paul, wonderful presentation. So there's a little pat on the back for you. Uh, any relationship of your measurements with degree of snow cover? And since I helped with a lot of this, I'm going to help you get started with that one. Um, we did measure snowpack when the trees were young, um, because early on they were actually, that was, um, potentially an insulating factor, uh, but they pretty quickly got up above the level of snowpack. Um, and so the shoot freezing injury in particular is, you know, at the more exposed parts of the tree. So it didn't seem to have a big impact, but Paul, if, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, so we did at, at, at the um, at various places we have looked at snowpack um, and uh, more recently, um, at the second college grant at the Adaptive Civil Culture for Climate Change study, where uh, American chestnut, those are actually B3, F3 chestnuts were planted. And this is a pretty cold place in, in northern um, uh, New Hampshire. Uh, pretty consistently, you can see by the, by the, the level of the, the height of the winter injury where the snowpack was. So, um, you know, these plants, um, and they've only been there like four years or something, but they, they grow uh, tremendously during the growing season. Snowpack builds up, and then at that kind of average snowpack level, the trees become winter injured above that. Um, and then next year, they, they start going again in, in kind of a cycle. They, uh, so snowpack does buffer even the upper portions of the plants, not just the roots. Um, and at least when the plants are young, uh, you can actually see the influence of that. Well, and as a related follow-up, Mike also wonders if you could comment on whether trees, quote unquote, learn um, or somehow outgrow a vulnerability to cold. Is there a juvenility to that or? Yeah. So we've, we've not, we've not um, measured that kind of directly. But observationally, um, and Kendra, you can attest to this as well, at, at least at Goshen and some other places, it seems that yes, that they're very vulnerable when they're young and their carbon relations are perhaps more constrained. Um, but as they, uh, they grow and they start having full crowns and they're really uh, photosynthesizing like gangbusters during the growing season, at some point, um, the you know, you don't see as much winter injury. It still probably is there in part, but also the level of shoot damage compared to the amount of, uh, of volume of crown and stem, it's, it's, it's much more limited. So again, we've not quantified it uh, specifically, but observationally, um, I'd say yes, that it, it, it seems to outgrow it. Awesome. And um, Anita actually asked a similar question about um, whether they move from juvenile to mature growth, whether the move from juvenile mature growth to, uh, changes their cold tolerance. She also wondered if the provenance test is still growing. The provenance test is still growing. Um, so, uh, and again, it's, it's not just the provenance test, like I showed in the open growth, 
Um, it's actually also uh, those same seed sources grown in a partial canopy and a closed canopy forest. We're actually putting together um, some data about long-term growth and uh, mortality for that planting. Uh, and we're talking about maybe even uh, doing the second stage of the shelter wood cut to see how the plants uh, respond to that, both as a population, but also uh, by temperature zone, et cetera. Um, well, and kind of related to the um, longevity of that planting, Eric asks, are you expecting the blight to kill the American chestnut soon? If they were planted in 2009, they are now entering their 13th year. There's yeah, so, a lot of blight in there. <laughs> there's a, there is a lot of blight in it. So that's the downside of having a range-wide provenance test. So it's a lot of work. And basically, the trees are all doomed. Um, so um, I guess that, that um, you know, speaks to the fact that it'd be good to go in there and get as much data as you can before, before they all die. Um, so for example, doing the, this next stage of the shelter wood cut, et cetera, uh, while you still have plant material to respond. Yeah. And we certainly see a lot more blight in the open. You know, the trees are much, much bigger in that open area than they are in the shelter wood and certainly in the closed canopy part of the forest. So there's not a whole lot of blight in those areas yet. Um, but that was a consideration for coring the trees. We were really nervous about poking holes in chestnuts. Um, so we did that in the late fall um, when they were dormant and hopefully blight was also dormant. So it was, I think, pretty chilly when um, Paula and Harry were doing the, the coring. Um, but we actually, we followed up and we didn't actually find that any blight colonized the coring hole. So that was actually pretty reassuring. We didn't cause any extra damage. Um, they, they healed in some weird ways, but um, we didn't see any blight actually colonizing those wounds. Um, and actually kind of related, Brad wants to know, it, does winter damage and spring frost damage increase the odds of blight successfully attacking or pro by providing entry points? I haven't seen that out there. Most of the, that injury, you know, frost damage has primarily been on the, the leaf tissue um, and the shoot damage is on pretty skinny little stems. So usually we see blight in the branch crotches and in other, you know, larger wounds in the cambium. So I would say no, but I don't know. I, I know there was a paper that suggested that, um, frost susceptibility also left trees more vulnerable to blight. I don't remember whose that was. I just remember it from my lit review. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Paul. No, you did a great job of that. All right, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, let's go back up to the top here. Um, Meg Allen has some questions for you. She says, as a molecular scientist, I'm always curious about what is happening in the molecular genetic context of the organism. Do you have a feel for the epigenetic factors involved in cold tolerance and the freeze response? And I know she had another one too, but let's start with that one. So I know I know about the, um, so I guess the short answer is not in the epigenetic sense. I know, I know physiologically that it's basically three factors that modulate cold tolerance uh, a lot. One is changes in lipids in the, in the membranes uh, two is changes in uh, sugars, um, which do a variety of things, um, including glomming onto uh, uh, molecules, um, protecting them phys uh, physically, but also uh, making the cytoplasm as kind of a, uh, a kind of a gel state. So it helps uh, keep the, the cytoplasm from freezing. Um, and the third is changes in proteins. Um, so there are certain proteins, especially dehydrins, that, uh, again, protect the, uh, the cell from dehydrating so much uh, that it, it's, um, it's injured in that sense. Because as, a, as the, uh, the, the tissue uh, freezes, a lot of the water leaves the cytoplasm, goes into the cell wall, and forms uh, 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 ice out in the cell wall. And that process gradually pulls water out more and more from the inside of the cell. You don't want to do that infinitely because you need water to preserve life. Um, but anyway, so those are the three changes that occur. And you know, those are under genetic control, but how, how it is in the actual 
genome versus the um, expression of that genome, I'm not aware. Well, and Meg also asked, and Tom kind of addressed her question already, but I'm curious your, your response here. Um, she's in the South. Um, she says she's in the Mississippi Delta and was wondering if anyone was doing kind of an opposite study looking at heat tolerance. And I actually don't know how that would work. I know how we do cold tolerance, but um, any comments on that? Uh, I'm not aware of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> no, no knowledge. I'm, I can just say stuff, but no, I don't. No specific knowledge. I, well, it, you, you, I will say that you know people do um, manipulations of air temperature either in controlled chambers, um, which you can just you can dictate the the temperature, or they actually even even in open top chambers, people just heat uh, the space above you know x degrees above uh, whatever the ambient temperature is. Uh, so those kind of studies exist for other species. Uh, I'm unaware that anyone's doing that for chestnut. Okay. Um, here's kind of a fun one from Mark. Uh, he said, he wonders, is there regional variation or a genetic basis for the retention of dead leaves in winter like beech do? Uh, it seems that individual chestnut trees are consistent year to year in losing their leaves or retaining leaves. Those that retain leaves are susceptible to ice or heavy wet snow damage here in Maine. I don't know what you know about abscission layer formation. Anything? Well, I mean, we've studied it in maple, um, and uh, but that's a species that is successful in completing that abscission layer right through, and the leaves fall off. Um, I presume that for you know beech, oak, and you know similar species that retain the leaves. Um, longer, and especially uh, immature beech, which can retain it super long, that it's just that that, uh, that final progression of the abscission layer between the petiole and the uh, branch junction uh, just doesn't complete all the way through. Uh, in sugar maple, that, that abscission layer starts surprisingly early. You know, in August, it actually starts being formed. Um, and how fast and how far it's formed depends on temperature cues. Um, but uh, I just presume that it's just that that process does not follow through all the way. And I'm uncertain what the adaptive benefit of not completing that process would be. Um, you know, as I said, for beech, you see it when it's uh, not a mature tree, but you, see, you really don't see it as, as a mature tree. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. All right, well, we have a question from Russell, who's our stalwart, um, perfect attendance chestnut chatter. Um, he wonders, what would happen if the temperature would go down to zero for one day? So zero Fahrenheit or? I'm gonna say yes, probably. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, if, if the plants are, um, you know, cold acclimated. So the temperature goes down to zero for one day and it's, you know, December or something, uh, nothing will happen. Um, you know, as, as we showed from Kendra's data, even in early December, uh, the shoots were, were pretty darn cold tolerant, not as optimally cold tolerant as they are in February, um, but they're very cold tolerant. So they can handle a zero day, no problem. And they can probably do it much earlier. Um, and zero um, Fahrenheit is not a hard frost. Uh, so, you know, that can happen even at the tail end of the growing season. And, you know, trees are not cold tolerant much at all then, but they can handle that. All right. Oh, it looks like Evan Fox is running away. I was just about to get to his question. So I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, Evan asks, says, insofar as sensitivity to cold is believed to be the reason the Northern range has historically ended in Northern New England, like Vermont, is it believed that climate change or warming has shifted this map and has a model been used to redraw it? That's part one. So the presumption is that um, the environment will get uh, more hospitable to American chestnut and that could allow it to shift it, what they call the suitable habitat and basically, if, you, if, if the habitat becomes more suitable, then eventually, either through planting or through very slow um, natural migration, 
uh, you, you would, might expect the map to change. As far as somebody modeling that, uh, I'm unaware of people doing that. Kendra, you might have a better idea than I do, but uh, I'm unaware of people uh, modeling the, the, uh, you know, the climate envelope for American chestnut. Yeah, I'm not aware either. I know that would actually be, a, Sarah really is into chestnut mapping and might have a better answer for that one. So I will um, point out that the, there's a thing called the Climate Change Tree Atlas that, oh yeah, that, that, does, that does map suitable habitat. Um, and uh, it's, it's in part climate related, but it's also, uh, there are other factors that relate to what they consider suitable habitat for a species. There's a lot of soil factors, there's land use change factors. And uh, the Climate Change Tree Atlas, which is actually done by my organization, the US Forest Service, does have a map for American chestnut. However, I, uh, I've looked at it and uh, it's, it's not very, I, don't, I, don't, I doubt that it's very accurate just because they have to start with a population that they use to, to decide what's the sweet spot for the species. And with American chestnut, the sample size for that is, is pretty horrible, as you know, because the species um, you know, has declined so, so much. Uh, I doubt that we actually have a, a, a great view of what the natural suitable habitat is. All right. Well, there's a second part to Evan's question. He says, is there a reason or evidence to believe the addition of the OXO transgenic gene will cause transgenic trees to behave more like the warm, moderate, or cold climate control group, or hasn't this been tested or hypothesized? I wouldn't expect them to make much difference at all, but I want you. I, I would expect it. the same thing. I mean, you're basically adding one gene that, as far as I'm aware, is unrelated to cold uh, hardiness or, or um, other climate adaptations. Um, and so other than that, it's, it's all chestnut, you know? So yeah. uh, I, I know that for that breeding program, there is a desire to, um, increase the genetic diversity uh, of, of the stock so that it, it presumably is uh, adapted to a range of circumstances and climate and otherwise. And just as that's important for the backcross breeding program or whatever, um, that would be a consideration. But I doubt that that addition uh, is, is really influential in that way. I would agree with that assessment. And we are working on that diversification and preparing to, to really roll that out. Uh, Greg asks, do you see freeze damage in the cambium of older shoots expressed as dead regions on the stem, usually on the southwest exposed stems? Here in Ohio, I've seen this kind of damage, especially on European chestnut. So um, in my experience, we don't see older shoots as being damaged. I'm not sure of what, what's being asked about might be, you know, what they call up here frost cracked kind of things that it's often on the Maybe. south. I'm not sure Greg. Um, he's got a pretty, he's got a lot of older trees in his collection as far as I, I know. If, it, if this is the Greg I think it is from Ohio. Um, I mean most of what we were seeing was current year shoot damage. Um, I haven't seen a lot um, on like the on the sides of stems but um, you know just in my travels around New, New England um, we also don't have a lot of like super exposed sites, so not sure. Yep. Okay. I agree. Sorry, that wasn't a very satisfactory answer. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. John asks, have you run across anything that suggests that just before the blight hit, uh, C. dentata was slowly continuing to move northward in response to the end of the ice age, i.e. continuing to acclimate or is the end of the Northern range also a function of other factors like more alkaline soil? So I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, you know, Honesty it, is it, a good policy. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the presumption for many species is that the Northern range limit is, um, you know, uh, related to winter low temperature exposure. And indeed for some species, I've seen an overlay of uh, the actual contour of, of the low temperature um, profile of the landscape with the range of the species. So I, I've seen this, for example, with red spruce, and the two line up 
dramatically <laughs> like it's it's surprising how much right on top of one another they are so um i would think that that's a dominant factor could other things be at play yes um and but were, were those things changing uh, at the end of the ice age uh maybe but you know it's all it's presumed that species migration takes a long time and that's especially the case for heavy seeded um you know uh species like american chestnut where you know the, the squirrel moves it you know 50 feet <laughs> and then that's where it is or probably just eats it um but uh, yeah so uh not aware of any data to that effect and would take right. a long time. Well, we're, we're slow, we're very quickly approaching the end of our time here. We've got about four minutes and a hard stop at one. Uh, let's see, Mike, Mike asks, might the better performance of 200 plus south or 200 degrees south sources be because we've seen a change in environment with climate change, i.e. what these trees from 200, 200 degrees I don't know what his plus sign is actually meaning. South we're adapted to is now what we see 200 plus miles north. So the that number, that very well. yeah, that number 200 plus miles south actually comes from a range of studies, many of them you know, long before we were seeing the effects of, of climate change. So you know, these include provenance tests that were put in in the you know 1940s and um, and analyzed in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so this, uh, this measure of that, the uh, further south seed sources outperforming others um, long predates any uh, you know, noted effects of climate change. So this is something that's a, a, a long standing phenomenon. Um, and, uh, you know, Will, will that shift over time as population uh, suitable habitat shifts? Uh, I would I would suspect so, but we don't know that. All right, I'm going to pick off one last one here. Um, Eric Carlson says, how does cold affect the flowering of trees from southern provenances? We have trees from Georgia planted in New York, and they have refused to flower despite being well past the normal stage of flowering for our other trees from colder climates. So that's interesting. Um, so we've looked at leaf phenology um, uh, for these trees in, in the range-wide provenance test. And a lot of these trees uh, are maturing if they're not dying. Um, and you know, they flower, they're producing a lot of uh, burrs. Uh, and Kendra has, has uh, followed this better than I have. But to my knowledge, we've not looked, uh, tried to quantify differences in flowering. Have you ever tried to do that, Kendra? Now, Paula and I thought about trying to do flower phenology, and it's such a tight planting that all the flowers are up very high, and we were actually thinking about a drone to get in there, but figuring <laughs> out which flowers were actually on which trees um, was actually a lot more complicated than we thought um, it might be. So we haven't actually done a good job of that, uh, or actually figured out a good way to do that, I should say. It's still an interesting thing to think about, especially as those trees are getting blighted and many more of them are flowering than they than were. I mean, they're just kind of really starting to hit their stride from that perspective. So um, haven't noticed any impact at this point, but um, yeah. Anyway, we are at end time. I apologize. There's a few unanswered questions. Um, I think Tom was working on typing answers to some of those if possible. So um, we'll try to get back to folks if we can, um, but thank you all for tuning in. Next month is, um, we'll be meeting March 18th for another episode of Chestnut Chat. Sarah will be back and hosting, so congratulations. You guys will get to see her smiling face again. Um, the topic is TBD, so it'll be a surprise. We'll let you know, um, but hope you can tune in, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today. And Paul, thank you again for your time. It was a great talk. My pleasure. A lot of fun. Thank you, Paul. And thanks, Kendra, for stepping in. Beautiful job. Sarah would be proud. And thanks to everybody. Stay warm and let's hope spring gets sprung very soon. Take care, everyone. Yes, please. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thank you.